Well, uh, good morning, Paul Brakovic and uh, Allison. Is your last name Grote these days, Allison? It's Grandy. Grandy. I'm on my That's phone app, though. I probably haven't changed it on my app. Yeah. So thank <laughs> you. A lot of places to change it. Yeah. Thank you both for joining us uh, this morning in New Zealand and this afternoon in, in Minneapolis. Um, Paul, I have to tell you that I have been an enormous fan of your wines for a long, long time. I've probably been a fan, fan of your wines longer. Well, I know I've been a fan of your wines longer than Allison has been alive. I may have been a fan of your <laughs> wines longer than you've been alive because I go back, I, I think I go back to the late 70s. Oh, right. With okay. your wines. Um, yeah. I think I was in the set, late 70s and early 80s, I was the major d you know, back when that phrase existed, uh, yeah. I was the maitre d' at a very fine French restaurant uh, here in the U.S. And uh, we had your Chardonnay uh, uh, on the list at the restaurant. It was one of our it was one of our best white wines. I mean, we were really proud to serve it. Um, so I and I think that was the late. Well, I know I worked there in the late '70s, and I think we had your wine, your Chardonnay, on the list in the late '70s. So um, it, it's likely to be around from more mid to late 80s because the, we, we started working with Wilson Daniels in 87, 88. In fact, M Michael and I met Jack and Wynne at the London Wine Trade Fair in 1988 and they started buying the wine then. So the first vintage I think we sent to the US was 87. It may have been 86. Uh, but the first vintage of Pumi River Chardonnay was 85. Before that, um, the wines were known as, uh, as uh, San Marino Vineyards. Right, um, right. Well, was... I'm, I'm confusing the the timeline, I, but I, I, I'll stand by my opinion that I've been a fan of your wines as long as it's possible for me to have been a fan <laughs> of them. <laughs> I don't want to misrepresent things, but I have been a fan of them for a long time. And by, co by an enormous coincidence, well, we're, we're going to share this video, this recording with our friends and clients on uh, Saturday this coming Saturday. And this past Saturday, I, uh, our tasting was with Mike Gergich from Gergich Hills, oh, right. yeah. who, you know, like your grandfather, I guess, um, immigrated to the United States from Croatia in, uh, as your grandfather Im immigrated to New Zealand from Croatia, correct? Correct, yes. And I know so, uh, that I had his Chardonnay on the list at that restaurant and it was, <laughs> I know that for a fact. And, that that uh, certainly would have been from the late 70s. And, yeah, and um, he, it, we, we knew you were a high roller if you ordered it because it was $40 on the restaurant wine list. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, that, you know, that was considered a really expensive bottle of wine at, at, in uh, the late 70s, early 80s. You know, that's yes. one of the many ways the world has changed in the time since. So as we get started, I'd, I'd encourage everyone uh, joining us to pour themselves a glass of the Village Chardonnay, the Kimo River, Kimo Village Chardonnay, um, the 2019 vintage. And because uh, we want everybody to have a good time. And this is a wine tasting, not a wine lecture. So my first question, and I'm sure you've been asked this a lot, but do you have hobbits working for you in the vineyards? No. <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, yeah, there might be a couple that you could describe or like that, but uh, <laughs> as a term of endearment, but uh, but no, we have, uh, in the vineyard, generally, we have um, about 10 people full-time over the winery and, 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 and the vineyard, three of which are in the, uh, in, the, in the vineyard, the rest are in the winery, but during the course of the season, you know, depending on what's happening in the vineyard, we'll, we'll get extra labour, so over the pruning season, which will be coming up, uh, in June, we'll have an extra 10 or two or three months during pruning. And then during harvest, we obviously get in around about 40 to 50 uh, people uh, because we hand harvest everything. Yeah. And uh, and leading up to harvest with the, the leaf plucking and shoot positioning and things like that, we might have an extra 10 or 20 as well, just depending on, on the season. But, well, obviously, no. my, obviously, my question was intended to be humorous and you you probably didn't find it very humorous, so <laughs> I apologize. That for those of uh, us who 
aren't exactly where New Zealand is relative to other parts of the world that we might be more familiar with. Can you give us a little bit idea of how far, how long a flight it is from the local, the closest Australian airport or? Well, to fly to Australia, you're looking at three or four hours uh, to Sydney or, or Melbourne. Um, to fly to Los Angeles, you're looking at 12 hours. Um, to fly to London, you're looking at 24 hours. And clearly, uh, either stopping in Asia or, uh, or the US on the way. So we're not that far away. Um, and um, where we're located in New Zealand is at the top of the North Island. So we're, we're 20, 30 minutes drive northwest of Auckland City. And we have vineyards here in Kumu. And But we've also bought vineyards now in Hawke's Bay, which is in the central North Island. And um, But we actually bring the grapes, we hand half the grapes in Hawke's Bay and then bring them to our winery in Kumu and process them there. So the, you know, this village Chardonnay that we're trying first up, that has uh, a portion of Hawke's Bay fruit in it as well, about 25%, and the rest is, is Kumu grown. But everything's hand harvested. And so just, I'm trying to get the geography firm in, in New, uh, Tasmania is southeast of Australia. Is that correct? Yes. Southeast? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah correct. Pretty far from you. Well, again, you know, if, if you did fly direct to Tasmania, it would it'd be around about a four hour flight. And they're, yeah, I've tasted some pretty good Pinot Noirs from there uh, recently, yeah. so they're, they're, they're coming on. So, um, so talk to us a little bit about North Island, South Island, what that means. What makes, New, I mean, obviously New Zealand is a very special place. You often hear it referred to as the most beautiful place on earth, uh, the best quality of life on earth. Um, and the wines are remarkably different from wines made from the same grapes in other parts of the world. What, what is it about New Zealand that makes it so unique? Well, I, I describe the whole country as, as cool climate, even though we're, you know, quite well north. Um, people look at us on a map and, and say, well, you're that far north, you must be quite a bit warmer than, than the south. Now, the country is, is, is a very long and narrow country, so you do get quite striking differences from the, from the top to, 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 to the bottom. Um, the North Island, generally, you're probably looking at more pasture land, lovely rolling hills. Uh, and when you get to the south, it, it's, it's more mountainous. Um, uh, it seems like Otago, certainly more continental style of climate. But that, that's a very, very strong uh, uh, generalisation of, of those two islands. But there's a lot of diversity um, in, in the geography and and and, um, and and the way the country looks. And uh, people come here thinking that they'll spend two weeks in New Zealand, do a week in the North Island, do a week in the South Island, and when they get to the, the trip, they realise that they've just been woefully underestimating how long it takes to get around this country. Um, and invariably, they attempt to come back. And uh, once all this COVID thing, hopefully. Is over in the next few years, we'll, we'll get more people coming back here because at the moment we don't have any, any tourists or any, any visitors here at all. But um, the climate where we are in, in Kumu is, is quite moderate in terms of um, temperature. So a hot day in the summer is going to be around about 24, 25 degrees Celsius. Occasionally we get 30 degrees Celsius, but not often. And in the, in the winter, um, a, a cold day is going to be around eight or nine degrees uh, Celsius. We, we do get frosts here, but we don't get snow. Now, if you go to the deep south in central Otago, you know, clearly over the winter, they get a lot colder and uh, their growing season can be a little bit shorter. But in the summer, they can get quite warm. You know, they, they will hit 40 degrees Celsius. Um, but um, they will have issues both with spring frost and, and frost you know, very cold weather coming up towards harvest time. So you know, I've been in uh, Central Otago when um, the had grapes ready to pick and they'll they'll get snow and then all of a sudden it makes the fruit very easy to pick because all the leaves have died and all this red fruit's sticking out there. 
but they can get very vibrant, very bright fruit uh, characters, particularly from Penrith right down there. And I think as a general rule, that's what people do see in New Zealand wines. It's, it's quite lively, quite bright fruit. And, and sometimes you do need to sort of temper it a bit because it can get a bit too intense. And that could do with the, you know, with the light we get here. Um, we do have very, uh, very bright lights and um, it does seem to uh, affect the, uh, the vineyards and the, and, and the characters we get from the fruit as well. Tell me, what is your position at the winery? I look after marketing sales and exports. Is your father still actively involved? No, dad passed away in 1992. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, and my brother, Michael, uh, who's the winemaker, is master wine. Uh, he started the, he, well, he started working here in 1982, 83. Um, and then my brother, Millen, who's an engineer, looked up, now looks after all the vineyards we have. He started working here in 86. I started working here in 1990. And my sister Mariana, who was in the hotel industry for a number of years, she started working here in um, 19, about 20 years ago, um, after she retired from that um, from that role. So it's still very much family, family, family run. But Michael's been the one. Michael just uh, did his uh, 40th vintage here, which completed about a week, week and a half ago. I. I was confusing Michael with your father when I asked that question. I apologize. That's okay. Some some people have done that before as well. I don't mind. Well, in in your in your picture on the website, you look like you're younger young enough to be his son. So I was a little. <laughs> I, uh, and how how old were you? I mean, it's it's. I think it's somewhat unique that all four of you want to be part of the family winery. Is it, in my conversations with people around the world the last year on these. Uh, conversations we've been having. Um, uh, it's, it's, I think it's very unusual. How old were you when you knew you wanted to be in the wine industry the rest of your life? Or I think it was it was always there in the background, but I didn't actually make the decision to do so after I uh, left university. So I was probably around 20, 21, um, when I thought, well, this is a really interesting business to get into. And, and also, at that time, we had just started exporting. So I was still at university when I went with Michael to the 1988 London Wine Trade Fair because the Kimmy River had just started exporting to the UK back then. And that's when we and, and started dealing, dealing with them. So um, it was a good time for me to enter the business because, you know, all the export opportunities were, were just started. Well, talk to... Talk to us about the, Char the Village Chardonnay, the 2019 Village Chardonnay. Well, the Village Chardonnay has always been the you know, entry level, if you like, of the, of the Chardonnays we make at Kimmy River. And initially it was always there as a, um, uh, as a way to make sure the estate Chardonnay stayed at a very, very high level. Um, over the years, the Village Chardonnay has become more of its own, its own thing, but still the vineyards that go into this are the vineyards that aren't quite good enough to go into the estate shard. They're a little bit high yielding um, and not quite the, the density that we're looking for for the estate shard. Now. So as such, we've always tended to ferment this either in tanks or older barrels. Um, we have now augmented this with some um, fruit that we buy from a, a grown hook stay in the, in the Dartmoor Valley. Um, but it still sticks to that very much the aperitif style Chardonnay. It has this lovely, you know, fragrant, um, you know, almost shabby like character on the nose. And on the palate that comes through, it's very lively, it's very crisp. I like to call it the perfect aperitif Chardonnay and, and something you should probably constantly have in the fridge. It is something which you can quite happily drink by itself. Um, it goes well with all the, the seafood type of things you'd expect it to. And uh, as a style that you you drink in you know, the first you know, two or three years of, of its life to you know, maintain its lovely vibrant, vibrancy and, and freshness. So the oak we use in this, this is, has about 25% barrel fermented, but the barrels are all older barrels. At least uh, five to 10 years old. And the rest is tank fermented. Uh, we still hand harvest everything. So this still gets the, you know, the same sort of Rolls-Royce treatment, if you like, of the, of, of the better Chardonnays. Um, it is a whole bunch of pressed. It's all wild yeast fermentation. And it spends around about 10, 11 months on, on lees before bottling. So it does 
you know, it does lend itself to a little bit more complexity than just a, a fruity, simple shot. There's, you know, there's something a little, a little bit more going on in the glass than just um, a very simple fruity shot. Uh, with the old casts, you're not looking for any oak character in the wine. You're looking for some um, beneficial oxidation from the oak, right? Well, yeah, it's fermenting in a barrel is, is quite different from fermenting in, in tanks. And you do get, as you say, a little bit of that slow um, oxidative effect. And um, even though the barrels are old, you still do get a, a toasty character, um, if you like, from um, from the fermentation in, in those older barrels. You just don't get the overt, you know, sweet vanilla oakiness. Uh, and for a wine like this, that, that's beneficial. And it's... Um, it, it concentrates a bit more on the fruit, and, and the fruit, as I mentioned, being a little bit higher yielding, um, tends to be a, a little bit more delicate. So if you if you hit this with a, a bit of new wood, it would be a bit over the top. Um, so those older barrels just lend that sort of, as you say, that slightly nuttier, slightly more oxidated sort of character to it, but it, um, it lends itself to a bit more weight on the palate, and and, um, and also the, the lees aging in barrels is a bit easier to do than lees aging in, 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 in tank. Um, and uh, what Michael tended to do with a, with a tank uh, fer fermented wine had a propensity to go reductive, you know, because you've got a lot of lees yeah. there. So um, he, he saw a technique in a French textbook which, which basically emptied the tank, took the lees out, stirred them up, basically gave them a lot of air, and then put them back into the wine. Um, which we still do, although with the leaves in the tanks now, they, they tend to uh, micro oxygenate them to you know keep them clean. So you can keep the wine on the leaves there for a bit longer, which um, which is beneficial for the freshness of the wine, but avoiding those sort of reductive characters that can come through with uh, the tank fermentation and wine staying on the leaves for too long. It has some of the, sorry. It has some of the sorry. richness and weight that you associate with oaky or you know oaky california or chardonnays with with without the oak um sorry to say that question again it I'll has hear. some of the weight the heft of, yep. of 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 a chardonnay that was you know did have new oak treatment but without the oakiness that would be uh Objectionable in a wine at this in, in a wine at this level, I think. Yeah, yeah, and uh, we, we're very careful with uh, with oak, and even when you go up to the estate chardonnay, you'll you'll see that we're quite judicious with the with the amount of new oak we use, um, because you know we like using oak barrels. We just don't like using too much, and even when we use a new barrel, uh, we like to wash it out with a lot of hot water first, just to get rid of uh, what Michael describes as is the very water soluble oak, which is quite dusty. So with a new barrel, we'll put a, a bucket of hot water in there and swoosh it around, leave it soaking on one head overnight, and then re repeat the process the next day. And the liquid that comes out of these barrels is really quite brown and it just reeks sawdust. So you're just getting rid of that very, very dusty horrible stuff. And, and you're thinking, well, if we didn't do this, all that sort of color and dustiness would, would end up in your, in your wine. So, um, and that's why we like to use barrels for probably four to five years um, for the for the top Chardonnays before we, we sort of uh, take them down a level into the into the into the village Chardonnay. But you know, we'll we'll get ten years use out of a barrel um, before we discard them completely. And even the barrels that are ten years old, which we're we're selling now, um, it's secondhand barrels and basically selling it as, as, as planter pots for people who saw them are. Um, they're still in pretty good nick. Um, so, uh, yeah, new oak is important to keep. We, we have to buy new oak so we can keep you know, getting a, a, a stock of older barrels. Talk about the decision to go to uh, all screw caps, which well, for us, exactly it's, uh, sure when you did that, but it was very controversial. I, I remember it being very controversial at the time. Well, we went 100% in 2001. And uh, so everything we bought from 2001 onwards, all in screw cap. Uh, we'd lived with Cork Tank for a number of years, you know, through the, through the 80s and into the 90s. 
and every year rather than things getting better as the pork producers were promising things were just getting worse and uh, in the late eight, late 90s we were seeing pork tank rates going from five to ten percent up to thirty percent um, so um, it was around that time we actually started testing all the corks that we were buying before we'd used them and uh, to test the corks, we'd go to the cork supplier and randomly select 100 corks out of out of a bale, and then we would um, run a process where we'd soak each individual cork in a very neutral wine in a vial over, overnight. So 100 vials around the table, uh, being soaked for 24 hours, and then the next morning we'd come through and pour these wines out into glasses and evaluate them. So you'd evaluate them in terms of their colour, their aroma, and, and of course, if there was any TCA present. Now, a, a good batch, you would see 100 glasses of this liquid relatively pale, but obviously have some extraction from the pork, which you, you, you would expect. But the, the aromas would be would be clean, you know, clean sort of oaky sort of aromas. And so long as the um, TCA rate was below 2%, we would accept that batch. A bad batch of corks would range in colour from anything from you know, pale wine to dark sherry. Uh, the aromas would be TCA, fly spray, dead rats, um, really just quite disgusting stuff. And we saw you know, quite a few batches like that. Um, in 2000, when we, which was last year we used corks, uh, we tested 62 batches of cork using that method and rejected 42 of them as being unacceptable. And with the batches we did accept, we'd run the test again to make sure that we were happy with them before we used them. So straight away, you knew that um, you, were, you were going to live with 2 to 5% cork tank and, and you just had to accept that. Um, what became more prevalent that we started to notice after we used screw caps was that the variabilities that you get with pork. So not only were you dealing with TCA, but you were also dealing with leakers and also bottles that would, would oxidise. So in a case of wine which had aged for maybe, say, five years, um, with corks, you might get three or four bottles in that case which are really pristine perfect. And then the others would be, you might get a TCA bottle, but the others would be different in terms of their sealing ability. So you, you get some sort of oxygen. And we're thinking, well, the, like the good ones. And uh, when we started using screw caps, that was what we started to notice. And one of the worst batches of wine that we had with a very high cook tank rate was, you know, we had one lot, we had, to bring back, we had to bring back 600 cases from the US. So that, so all of that got discarded. And of course, it was part of a, uh, an insurance claim which had um, independent tasters coming in and tasting those wines. And out of the 100 bottles they selected from that batch to taste, they only found 25% um, of them um, good enough. The rest were being affected by the court in some way, shape, or form. And the other batch that we had, which we uh, isolated uh, 200 cases in 1999, that we were anecdotally getting a lot of cork tank from. So we thought, well, let's open every bottle and we'll really cork the good ones. And so four of us, myself, Michael, Willem, and Nigel, our cellar master here, would do 50 cases at a time. So two of us would, would have cork screws opening bottles and two would be tasting. So you'd pick up the glass and go, yeah, that one's okay, or uh, that's cork that goes over there. So we we're basically looking at TCA. And the separation we made, we threw away 30% of the wine due to cork taint, just classic TCA. But what was more alarming is one of the 20 bottles were picking up and going, wow, that one's really good. And you're thinking, well, actually, they all should taste like this. And the variation was huge. So um, as you can imagine, us going to screw cap was, was quite an easy decision to make. Um, because we'd already seen a lot of bottles, particularly bottled in Australia, that had been using screw caps since the late 60s, early 70s. And so we knew that, the, you know, A, that they worked, but B, and more importantly for us, was that a bottle age still happened under screw cap. Because that was the first thing that people would ask us, oh, you know, your wines won't age anymore because, you know, you know, screw caps will just lock them in time. Uh, but that's not the case at all. And now that we've got wines going back to 2001, and we've done many vertical tastings. I did a, a big vertical tasting at Carmen a couple of years ago where we tasted the Stage Chardonnay, Coddington, Hunting Hill, and Matthew's Vineyard, 
from 2017 to 2006, so 12 instances. It was obviously, you could see the, the lovely development of buffalo age over, over a 10, 12 year period and how the wines were, were aging. Um, but they would still retain a, a brightness about them, which if you get a really good cork, you, you get the same thing. But getting a really good cork seems to, to us to be about 1 in 20, 1 in 25. So um, at the end of that tasting uh, that we did at the car, I, on, I only sent one bottle of each wine. So it's 48 wines, one bottle of each. We did not have one of them. Now, if we were using corks, I would have sent two or three bottles of each, and I can guarantee we would have had problems. And even all the tasters who are in the room, people like Jancis Robinson, Neil Martin, Oz Clark, um, they all said they found it remarkable to be able to tasting of 48 wines and not have a happiness bottle because a few in a room with 48 wines and corks, yeah, just, that just wouldn't happen. So we are very, very pleased with the decision to go to Screw Cap and we've never looked back and we've never gone back. Well, I mean, you know, the reality is that almost all Sauvignon Blanc in the world should have a Screw Cap. Almost all the Gamay, almost all the Merle. I'm not talking about Chateau Patrice, but most of the I'd Gamay. be very happy to buy Chateau Patrice of the Screw Cap. I'll do Sorry? it tomorrow. I'd be very happy to buy Chateau Patrice of the Screw Cap. Because well, I think the aging would be far more consistent and far better. Because even with, even with the great ones of the world, you have still got the variability between bottle to bottle, and and we see it with the bottles that we are, we open a lot of really good Burgundy and, and Bordeaux at, at at the winery, and and we just see inconsistencies with, with the closure, and you think, well, why would you do it? I mean, the the next thing with um, and you're seeing a lot of Burgundy producers going there is is Dian. And for us, you know, that is a preferable option to uh, to natural pork, uh, but it's something that's been around that long. Uh, but from what we've seen, you know, the sealability and, and the consistency is so much better than using natural pork. Um, you know, to us, the natural pork, you know, I, I can't see any any reason to use it. I I, I couldn't agree with you more. I just didn't want to. Uh, be quoted as saying that Shadow Patrice should change to screw caps because <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm happy to say that. <laughs> well, you know, it, the, you know, the, there's things about this that that you know that concern me. If I, you know, if somebody comes in our wine store and asks me to recommend a bottle of wine for them to have with a grilled ribeye tonight, and I suggest a bottle of wine that I think is the perfect wine in their comfort, you know, price point comfort level to have with a grilled ribeye tonight. And they take it home and they open it and it's corked. And they don't know what that means. They don't know what cork taint is. They're not going to shop with us anymore. Yeah. They're going to think that I recommended a bad wine. And yeah. that scares the hell out of me. Yeah. And you know what happens. Yeah, totally. And, and, and then the other thing is, assuming that you're a dot-com billionaire and you bought a case of Chateau Patrice when your daughter was born with the intention of serving it at her wedding reception or something, and then 25 years later, you open a case, you, know, you open 12 bottles of Patrice that Lord knows what they're worth at that point thousands yeah. and thousands of dollars a bottle if it's a good vintage and you you need you know you you need 12 bottles to serve the dinner party and only 10 of them are you know servable yeah. well i can guarantee all 12 will be slightly different you know, we had a case where um we bought a case of pelini montrachet 1999 Champ Cam this is a number of years ago uh, from a very very good grower uh, on the basis of a tasting we'd been to and thought well this this is really impressive so let's walk out the money and buy a case. And then one Friday afternoon at the winery, we thought, oh, let's open something decent. So we went and grabbed the first bottle out of the case and uh, tasted it. And all of us were thinking, I'm sure it was better than this. Yeah. I'll, let's open another bottle. So I opened a second bottle that was corked. So we went and grabbed another bottle, which was really, really badly oxidized. So we opened a fourth bottle, which was absolutely brilliant. So four bottles before you got something which you could actually 
which was a true indication of what the wine's really like. Um, well, and to me, that's, that's criminal. If, if they'd been using screw caps in Burgundy in the late 90s and early 2000s, they wouldn't have had all yeah. that problem with premature oxidation. Yep. No, I, I think that's a, a large part of it. Like that. Yeah. I mean, I agree. imagine how much white Burgundy was bought from Ramenet. People like Ramenet. I mean, t you know, the top wineries in Burgundy and the wines at three years old taste were done, finished. Yeah. Uh, wines that should have gone 30 years were finished at three years. Yeah. yeah. So it is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's too obvious a solution. Um, it should have been done a lot. I mean, you know, it's, I think somebody needs to invent a, a, a really, really cool device that you use to open a screw cap bottle. <laughs> you know that sings hallelujah or something when you when you unscrew the cap well there was someone who in australia or somebody in australia probably heard about who could open it with his elbow and then roll the the cap down his arm and catch it in his finger i thought this was quite clever that'd be pretty cool <laughs> well uh that's enough about that but um but I, anyway, I congratulate you. I, I felt this way when you made the decision. When I heard that you'd made the decision, I thought it was, I thought it was exactly the right thing to do, and I feel more strongly about it now than I did I did then. So, uh, congratulations, kudos to you and and your family for making that what seemed like at the time a painful decision, but I guess wasn't. It seemed like it sounds like it was the only thing you could you felt yeah. comfortable doing. Yeah, absolutely. So let's taste the uh, Estate Chardonnay, 2017. So this is, it's been a little while since I've tried this, but it should be looking terrific now with this little bit of bottle age on it, which um, we've always thought is, this is a wine that lends itself to a, a bit of bottle age. I mean, they are delicious to drink very young, but two, three, four years in bottle makes a huge difference. Uh, 2017 was a slightly cooler year, so we got quite crisp acids in, in the 17s, particularly the early the early part of the season was quite cool, and then we had a lovely, lovely summer. But um, uh, it always was more in the sort of the grapefruit spectrum of, of Chardonnay rather than the, the, the peachiness that, we, that we've seen with, with bigger, riper vintages. But... Um, the 17 has always been just quite a delicious wine. So, um, yeah, and, and now just with that little bit of bottle age on, it's starting to come through. And on the palate, um, typically you start to see a little bit more silkiness in the complexity. And, uh, and it just finishes with that lovely fine acidity, which I think is, just helps keeping the wine refreshing. And um, to us, you know, really good Chardonnay from any of the world has to have that refreshment fact that's got to have that lovely crisp acidity. And it's, um, in, over here, there was a, a bit of a movement, which was people were, were going away from Chardonnay because they found them too heavy or too rich and you know, too loud. And to me, it's a bit like um, uh, chefs making Beurre Blanc or, or Hollandaise. You know, when they're made really, really well, there's, there's a freshness and a lightness of touch about them, which you know there's a lot of butter and a lot of richness to them, but there's something about them which is uh, which seems light, and it's that balancing acidity. When they're made badly, they're gluggy, they're rich, they're heavy, and 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 they make you feel. Mm. But if they're done well, it's um, you know there's a, a refreshment factor there, and I think good chardonnay is uh, is exactly the same, and that's what we certainly aim for with with, with these. You're uh, famous for making Burgundian style chardonnay. Uh, what what does that mean? Well, for a number of years, the wines have been compared with uh, with Burgundy, and you know, really that is the benchmark. And when we started making these wines in the uh, in the, in the eighties, you know, we were looking at you know how, how does how does Burgundy make 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 Chardonnay? And um, there are a lot of similarities in terms of of climate with New Zealand and and and, and France. But you know the hand harvesting, the whole bunch pressing, the wild yeast fermentation, the use of barrels—they're they're all key aspects of, of uh, Burgundian winemaking, which we 
which we applied to what we were doing in Kenya. You know, we weren't trying to make white burgundy, but um, if you're doing things in a very, very similar way, you know, there are going to be hopefully similarities um, in terms of the balance and, and, and the quality of, of, of the Chardonnays that, that you're making. And a number of um, people in the, in the trade in the UK in particular picked up on this. And um, one uh, merchant, Far Vintners, uh, Stephen Brout, who's the chairman of Far Vintners, the first vintage he tried of ours was 1987, a state Chardonnay, and uh, it was served to him blind by a friend of his. And when he tasted it, he thought it was one of the, the better burgundies he'd tried in a, in a while and was very uh, intrigued to find out it was, in fact, a, a wine from New Zealand. So he was married to a New Zealander at that time. So he used to come down here quite often. And uh, he tried the 89 out of barrel and uh, loved it. And Farvin has actually bought every vintage of Tuberida ever, ever since. And Stephen's favourite party trick <clears throat> is to serve the wine blind to people. And uh, he's told me many times over the years that you know the most common response he gets is, oh, it's, you know, it's definitely Premier Cru Burgundy from a, from a decent producer. And most of the people he, he you know, served it to have, uh, have been surprised that it was, in fact, a lovely wine from, from New Zealand. So a few years ago, he decided to do a more of a formal um, test of this, if you like. So in 2015, we did a tasting. Um, this wine was in it. Um, oh, hang on. No, no, it wasn't. Sorry, it was the 2012 estate. So we had 2012 estate Chardonnay, 2017 Hunting Hill Chardonnay, 2010 Coddington, and 2009 Matties. And Stephen selected a bunch of burgundies, which were going to be served blind alongside them. So with the estate Chardonnay, it was, um, it was village level um, burgundies from Meso, Pulini, Chassan, from growers like uh, Chevalier, Soze, the Flev, and um, what else was in there? Neon, I think. And then with the, with the Matty's Vineyard, it was Premier Cru Mersos from the likes of um, uh, Bouchard, uh, Chevalier again, uh, I think they're Comte Le Fon in there. Um, and then with the, the Hunting Hill, it was Premier Cru Poulini's, and with the, with the 2010 product, was Premier Cru Chassa. So, you know, really good producers alongside the the Kimus. And in the room, there was people like Jancis Robinson, Neil Martin, uh, Jamie Good, um, Matthew Duke. So it was a room about 20 people, good tastes of people in the London wine trade. And all the wines were served blind in flights of four. So you had flights of five, sorry, you had one Kimu and, and four Burgundies. And at the end of each flight, everybody was asked for their scores and, you know, in, in an attempt to identify the wines. <clears throat> And um, at the end of the tasting, they tallied everything up and the Kumu wines, you know, an amazement to us, came top of every flight apart from one, who became first equal. But to me, and being in that room, seeing all these wines together, um, it wasn't about trying to beat Burgundy. It was, it was just a pleasure to have our wines sitting amongst great wines from around the world and, you know, belonging there. You know, they didn't look out of place at all. Um, and it was... Uh, you know, it was a real testament to the, I think, to the quality of the wines that they sort of stood up against the, against what they were being served against. Again, it's an amazing coincidence that last Saturday we had this tasting with uh, Velvet Violet, who's not Velvet Violet Gergich, um, yeah. and a similar event, of course, made her father very famous uh, when his Chateau Montalena Chardonnay wine, Stephen Spurrier's Paris State, the Judgment of Paris. Yeah. Um, and based on what you've said, the producers you've uh, listed, like Complefon and Soze, certainly uh, far vendors did not create an une uneven playing field where, where your wines had an advantage because they produced, they selected less, um, you know, vaunted producers to, to if you get you get my point that yeah, no, 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 you're exactly right. against the best. I mean, Do yeah. Lafon Le Le and you mentioned Do Domaine Lefleur and yeah. Comte Lafon. That arguably the two greatest white wine producers in Burgundy, certainly among them. Neil on. Yeah, so yeah, that, that's what I'm saying. We're, we're very happy to be sitting there amongst names like that and uh, and, and holding our own. It was, uh, it was it was terrific tasting. Actually, Stephen Spurrier was supposed to be at that tasting, um, which unfortunately he didn't make, but he did come to the, 
the, the vertical tasting we did two years two years later, the one I was talking about before, we did 2017 down to 2006. So uh, he saw that, but it would have been fun to have him at the at the other one, <laughs> uh, you know, giving the you know his connection of the judgment of Paris. He he uh, was at an event at a restaurant I was involved with in Nashville, Tennessee. Oh, I don't know, 25 years ago, and I think he's, I was probably more nervous about having him in the restaurant than anybody <laughs> I've ever. Uh, and I've and I've dealt, I, you know I've had some really famous people in restaurants over the years, but he, he, you know, he, he and he's a lovely. He was a, he was a lovely guy. He wasn't the least bit, you know, difficult or anything. It was just he was such a you know, monumental figure at that time in the world of wine. Um, you know, there's a distinction between, I think there's an important distinction between trying to make great white Burgundy in New Zealand and making great New Zealand Chardonnay modeled after great white Burgundy. Yep. Does that, does that compute to you? Yeah, totally. I mean, you, you you make wine from the grapes that you get and, and the area that you're in. And when you look at, you know, we've got five Chardonnays and you look at uh, you know, your state Chardonnay, which admittedly is a blend of, of uh, five different sites in this area. Um, it tends to be a little bit richer and, and weightier, um, you know, still complex. And then you have Coddington, another single vineyard that we have, which is even more layered and more more complex, it just has that more luscious volume about it. But then vineyards like Hunting Hill, which is uh, on a slope above Matty's Vineyard, opposite the winery, which uh, faces north, but undulates a bit towards the southwest on a on, a, on clay, but it, there's a there's an iron pan a few metres below the surface as well. It produces a very fragrant style of Chardonnay. It's quite different from, from the other Chardonnays that we have. And it's, it's very, very fine, very, um, it's very persistent, but it doesn't have the sort of the the weightiness and the, the robust nature that you see in the estate of Coddington. And then Matty's Vineyard, different again. So um, we are, and, and what we're seeing out of vineyards and Ray's Road and Hawke's Bay, which we've just bought, which is all in limestone, we're, we're seeing in different characters again. So it's, uh, you know, we are very much looking at making wines from the sites that they come from. Um, but uh, as I said, right from the beginning, if you're, if you're looking to make great Chardonnay, you look at the benchmarks of, of Old Grouch Chardonnay, which undoubtedly is is Burgundy, and uh, while these wines aren't Burgundy, you know, we would hope that they sort of fit in the in the same sphere of of you know you're looking basically for something for Chardonnay, which is of, of balance, texture, longevity, and and ultimately drinking pleasure, which which is what it's about. I mean, yeah. you know, the whole idea of of really good Burgundy and really good wines like this is that they're fun to drink and they're just quite delicious. And, and with bottle age, they they take on an extra dimension, and uh, that's what we, you know, that's what we certainly aim for. Do you think that wines age more slowly and gracefully and longer with screw caps than they do with corks? Um, I think if you get a really good cork and a screw cap, um, you'll see virtually no difference in terms of their aging ability or the way they age. It's the there's that misnomer that we've been hearing since 2001 is that, oh, the wines need to age under cork because the wine breathes through the cork. You know, the cork's in the bottle there to actually seal it, not to allow air in. And if it's allowing air in, it's not doing its job. And, and funnily enough, if, you, if you're buying wines at auction, which are 20, 30 years old grape wines, everybody looks at the yellowage level. And the first one you're gonna to go to is the one that hasn't leaked. You know, that's the bottle you want, you're going to want to buy. The ones that leak, you go, oh, yeah, but they might be okay. And often they are. But still, the ones you want are the ones that haven't leaked at all. And it's, it's where the cork's done its job properly. It hasn't leaked, it's sealed it properly. And that's what you get with a, with, with a screw cap. I mean, they're, they're as airtight as we, we can get. They're not totally, totally airtight, um, but they're probably about the same as what you'd expect with a, with a good cork. And with our own tastings, that's certainly what we've seen. We've seen the development under screw cap being much the same as you'd see. In fact, if you, if you put them side by side, you, you're hard pressed to tell the difference. But finding the good cork, that's the tricky one. You know, I used to be one of the sommeliers at the uh, Wine Spectator wine experience back when it would, 
alternate between New York and San Francisco and they would have, have those huge tastings, you know, with a thousand people in a room. Yeah. Um, and the job of, the main job of the sommeliers was to taste every bottle that went out to be served. So to be sure yeah. there are no cork bottles. Yeah. And so this, it's an unusual experience that I don't know any other uh, situation in which you'd have where you taste 120 bottles of the same wine right in a row. Yeah. Which we would do. So they would assign, you know, each sommelier a, a wine and you'd taste 10 cases of it. You'd open and taste 10, you know, 120 bottles. Yeah. Uh, which in some cases can be a really delightful experience. And if it's, but if it's, you know, if it's a young vintage port, it's, it's a pretty difficult experience. <laughs> Uh, you know, you feel like your teeth are coming out of your gums by then. But, but the, doing that quite a few times, um, your your assertion is absolutely correct that in 120 bottles of wine of the same wine, there are 120 different wines. Every the wine, each bottle is different, yeah. and there are a handful that really stand. Well, there's a handful that are corked. Yeah. or otherwise flawed. It's not just corked. You know, there's other problems with wine. Yeah. They can be light struck, they can be oxidized, they can be whatever. But there, you know, 120 bottles, there might be 15 that are not servable. And then there are six or 10 that are just absolutely glorious. Mm. And the difference between those is the, is the cork, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's the only difference. And then there's those bottles that stand out. And then you, then you have, it's the, that the, the scary thing, like I mentioned before, that somebody takes a bottle home and it's for, there's always the chance that a sommelier misses one. Yeah. And so one year at, there was a port, there was a port tasting with uh, the owners of Taylor and Fonseca and Graham's and somebody else, one of the other houses. But a corked bottle of 1970 Taylor went to the head table, to the dais. And Alistair Robertson, Robertson said, excuse me, my bottles, my glass is corked. Well, when, when, when he says it's corked, everybody in the room thinks there's his cork. Mm. So they all want a new glass. And there isn't any. <laughs> you know, it's all been poured. Yeah, what do you do? Yeah. You, know, uh, you, you go hide. <laughs> and that, that's all the... <laughs> That sommelier didn't get invited back the next year to be one of the sommeliers. Oh, no, that's, yeah, that, that is not yet. Yeah. yeah, but I, I, we've noticed ourselves now with some of the ones, ones were opened, you know, particularly if you're opening for lunch and, and uh, you open it and you look at it, and go, oh, yeah, that, that's, that's fine. But then, you know, 10, 20 minutes later, when you pour it again, it's, oh, oh hang on. <laughs> it's, uh, it can take a little while for it to, you know, to, to reveal itself. But, uh, very, very, very annoying when it happens. Well, let's talk about the the village Pinot Noir. Well, before we get there, do you make? Do you still make Sauvignon Blanc? We do make a little bit, um, and it comes from the vineyard that we just bought in uh, in Hawkes Bay, Rays Road, because this vineyard was uh, originally planted as a joint venture between Trinity Hill and Pascal Jolivet from Sancerre. So the site that they planted, they planted mostly the Sauvignon Blanc, but they also planted some Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. And so when we bought the property, it was the Chardonnay and the Pinot that we were after, but, and we were selling the Sauvignon Blanc to someone else. But because it was there, we thought, well, Pascal Jolivet really liked it, let's, um, let's give it a go. So we made some in 18, 19 and 20, uh, but we won't be making any more after that because we're actually replanting that Sauvignon with, uh, with, with Chardonnay. But um, it's quite a delicious little wine. It, um, it's you know, Sauvignon Blanc from limestone. It's very flinty. It has, you know, has a very, very citrusy, particularly lime flavor about it. And because we hand harvest it as well, it's, it, it's quite lithe and uh, perfect with, uh, with, uh, you know, with oysters. And uh, you know, it's, it's been quite fun to make. But, um, when that when it's gone, that uh, that'll be the end of it. Why did you? Why did your family decide on Chardonnay versus Sauvignon Blanc originally? What what generated? Well, that? basically, 
it basically chose us we're, because the Sauvignon Blanc we were growing here in Cumbia, we we're making a more of a white Bordeaux style of, of wine, but so it was barrel fermented, mostly older barrels, went through male lactic fermentation. So it was a it was quite a different style of New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, and it had its fans. Um, and we made that right up until 1998, 1999, I think. But it always lived in the shadow of the Chardonnay. And the Chardonnay, the quality of the Chardonnay was, was high. Um, we were getting more money for the Chardonnay as well. And just generally, you know, the, the perception was, well, this, you know, the Chardonnays are, are better. So when we had more, when we were looking at replanting things or, or planting more land in Kenya, it just made sense to plant more Chardonnay. So 80% of what we do now is Chardonnay. And the only other variety we, varieties we have, we've got some Pinot Gris here in, in Kimu, which does well. And we've got a tiny amount of Pinot Noir, which, uh, which makes some village and also some Hunting Hill Pinot Noir. And we also use some of the Pinot Noir for the, the Cremont base that we're, we're now making. Uh, but everything else is, is Chardonnay. And um, it's a, you know, the idea of you, you stick to what you're good at is, uh, is something that we've, we've played to. And, uh, and the idea, of, and now we've, we used to have, you know, two Chardonnays with Matty's Vineyard and the Estate Chardonnay, and then we had two single vineyards with Hunting Hill and Coddington, and now we've got the Rose Road Chardonnay as well. So, you know, for us, it's, um, you know, it's about, you know, making a better Chardonnay from the, from the locations that we have, which are, are clearly suited to, uh, to growing Chardonnay. You, could you make a really superb Sancerre style Sauvignon Blanc as opposed to a another think, New Zealand style Sauvignon Blanc, which probably the world doesn't need? I think that um, what we've done with the Sauvignon and, and Ray's Road and Hawke's Bay, I think that it, it is just that. It is, um, you know, it's very Sancerre like uh, Sauvignon Blanc. Um, I'll send you a couple of reviews that we've had for the <laughs> So none, none's come to the US as yet, but if it does, I'll, I'll let you know. It's, um, but again, it's not something that we're we're, we're chasing. And uh, with um, with the uh, with the new vineyard that we have, we are going to be growing more more sharply. Who who is your favorite New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc producer? Uh, Dog Point. Would, uh, Dog Point. I would say. Yeah, Dog Point and Grey Wacky would be the two that I would, yeah. I would, I would go to. Yeah. Okay, I thought you might say that. Um, <laughs> um, does who makes that Grim, Grimlet gravels? Gim, Gimlet gravels. Um, well, I'm blanking on the winery. The, uh, the wine winemaker was named Stephen Smith. Oh, Steve Smith. Yeah, yeah. Um, he was with um, he was with Craigie Ranch. He's now with Craigie um, Ranch. Yeah. Do you, their wines, and I've, it's going back a while, but I've tasted some craggy range Sauvignon Blanc that, and Merlot that I thought were pretty good wines. Yeah, I think I could be wrong. I think the Sauvignon Blanc that they have actually comes out of Marlborough. Um, yeah. Because when Craggy started, you know, their idea was to make single vineyard wines all over the country. And, um, and since they've started, they've actually sort of pared down some of the things that they've been doing and they've only... They're mostly based in Hawke's Bay. But I'm, I'm, I think I'm right in saying that the Sauvignon Blanc still comes out of Melbourne. You're right. I, I think you're right. Um, so talk about the Pinot Noir, please. Yeah, now the Pinot Noir, village Pinot Noir, is um, like the village Chardonnay has always been from vineyards a bit lighter and not good enough to go into anything higher up. Um, 2018 is actually entirely Hawke's Bay grown. And this is the first vintage we had from our... Uh, Raised Road Vineyard down there. Uh, the Kimu fruit in 2018 just didn't really happen. It was it was quite a wet vintage up here, um, so we didn't we didn't pick any Pinot Noir at all. Uh, so the village uh, Pinot from 18 was entirely Hawke's Bay. And what we liked about this, um, the better part of the Pinot Noir ended up going into a, a Kimu River Raised Road Pinot, and this was most of it, which was just that little bit lighter. Uh, this is the first year we had the vineyard, so we didn't actually look after the vineyard for most of the year. We we, we took it over in, uh, in January. The first thing we did was actually try to re reduce some of the yield on the Pinot. So we actually uh, cut quite a bit off, but it still yielded reasonably high, hence the you know the lightish colour. 
But uh, what really uh, excited us was that sort of fragrance we were getting from this wine, even from a vintage which was uh, was tricky, and from a vineyard that we hadn't looked after for a long time. But you get this very much this limestone fragrance out of it, and it comes from the palate too. It's a, it's a, there's a sort of an electricity about it that's really quite crisp and, and fine, even though it's light. And uh, you, you look at the the colour. Um, but the, the flavour you get out of this, I think, actually belies what the colour looks like. And um, this doesn't see any oak at all. It was all fermented in tank, went through its metal electric fermentation in tank. And it was bottled quite early. So yeah, it's just very, very pretty. Um, uh, it's, the temperature to serve it at, I think, is sort of cellar temperature around about 13 degrees Celsius, about perfect. If it gets a bit warm, it loses some of that very pretty strawberry and, and, and red fruits character. So if you've got it at a nice temperature, it just has that lovely vibrancy and, and freshness. And on the palate, it, yeah, it's just crisp and, and quite delicious. So. You know, I, I work, uh, a, a part of my job is uh, involved in a very fine Italian restaurant that we have. And so I, I taste a lot of Barolo and Barbaresco. So um, I'm not surprised when a wine is light in color, but not light in yeah. flavor. Uh, you know, I always say that I, one of the things I love about Barolo is you look at it and it looks like it's going to be light and insipid and then you smell it and it's this huge cornucopia yeah. of aromas and then you taste it and it's it's not heavy. It's powerful without being heavy. Yes. Yeah. And it, when you look at this Pinot Noir, it looks, it's very light in color. It's almost, I mean, it's, I can easily read the labels of the bottles through it. Yep. But it's not light in flavor, and it's and for a, you know, I guess it's basically it's three years old basically because it's from the southern hemisphere. Um, it's really tannic. I mean, it's a it's a it's a very surprising wine on the palate. Yeah, given the very light color. Well, again, you, you mentioned the tannin, and that's one of the pleasures I think about this wine because often at Pinot Noir around this price, they can be quite confectionery-like and quite sweet. And on the palate, they're quite cloying, you know? Whereas this, with this tannin, it just creates that freshness and that refreshment factor. And it um, and that little look of tannin just keeps it, um, you know, keeps the, keeps the mouth re refreshed. And uh, you can imagine sort of, uh, eating this with, with, with a wide variety of things, really. Well, and your, your uh, assertion that it, the temperature is important, I think, is it kind of applies to all wines, but certainly a wine like this, 55 to 60, 60 degrees Fahrenheit is gonna make a big difference in the way it tastes, as opposed to, you know, kitchen table temperature, which is 75 degrees probably. Yeah. Then it's, it's not gonna, this wine at 75 degrees Fahrenheit is not gonna be very attractive. Yeah, as I said, it loses all those lovely, pretty aromas when it gets too warm. And you know, we've seen you know, other other Pinot Noirs where we've been in restaurants and 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 they've come out and they've and they they just taste dull because they're they're too warm. Yeah. And you basically ask for an ice bucket just to <laughs> just to take the edge off the heat and just pull. And then all of a sudden the fragrance comes back. When I order, if if I order a glass of red wine in a, in most restaurants in the United States, I put an ice cube in them, <laughs> right? Because I, I'm not really that. I'm, the purpose is not to, you know, qualitatively evaluate the wine. It's just to enjoy a glass of wine, and the wine tastes a whole lot better if I put an ice cube in it for, for you know, two or three minutes and cool it down a little bit. People look at me like I'm crazy, but that you know, I just, <laughs> I just don't like warm, red, warm red wine. No, yeah, um, no, I agree. And most restaurants, you know, it's, you know. Again, it's off the bar, and the bar's it's seventy five degrees. Um, well, this you know this has been a lovely. I, I it confirms my long time uh, high regard for your wines. I think they're lovely, and you know we had a tasting with Laura Catena from uh, Catena Zapata in Mendoza uh, a few months ago. She was nice enough to join us, and she said that. Annually, they they taste their wines against similar wines that cost twice as much, and they know that they're succeeding in their in, in, in what they want to accomplish 
if their $20 wine is as good or better than their competitor's $40 wine, and that if their $100 wine is as good or better than their competitor's $200 wine. And I think that really is what informs their business. I think that's why one of the reasons their wines are, they're so successful and their wines are so special. Yeah. Is there, you know, the Telia wines for $10 don't taste like $10 wines. And the, <laughs> the, the, uh, sing, the single vineyard wines for $20 don't taste like $20 wines. And, and certainly these two, this shark, $20 Chardonnay and $20 Pinot Noir do not taste like $20 wines. Uh, Thank you. They just don't. And, and, and the estate Chardonnay, I mean, if you served it to me blind, I, w I don't think I'd be horribly embarrassed if I, again, as, as you said, if I said it was a Premier Cru um, Merceau, I don't think I'd be terribly embarrassed. Yeah, no, I think uh, Stephen Brewer said to me once, and I think Jensen Robinson even wrote it in one of the articles that she's been caught out at least twice <laughs> by Stephen. <laughs> Today. Uh, serving, you know, serving our wine blind. So, but, uh, no, it does happen. And we, we love hearing stories like that uh, you know, for us. It's, uh, you know, that's quite a nice thing. Um, I always ask this question at the end of these tastings, and uh, I hope you'll humor me and answer this question. Uh, and I I'm, I'm understand I'm not asking you what's the greatest wine you've ever tasted. That's not the question. The question is, what's the, your most memorable wine experience? Oh, um, there have been quite a few. <laughs> um, Uh, perhaps it could be. Um, I was lucky enough to be with Michael in the Wine Trade Fair in 1988, and uh, after we'd met um, Jack and Wynne, uh, they took us out to dinner and, and served us some, some very, very good wine. In fact, um, when Jack was sitting there trying to um, convince us that the horse annuals would be a really good option for, for Kimmy River to use as an importer distributor in, in the States, and Wynn was looking through the wine list and he came up to um, something on the list and he said, Jack, oh, look, Jack, they've got the 71 Grand Eches from DRC here. Let's have that. Yeah, no. And uh, so that was quite a memorable wine moment. And from that, we, um, they organised the visit for us to actually visit the domain and then taste through, uh, taste through the barrels, um, which would have been the 87 vintage. So that, you know, that does stick in my memory. Um, other other bottles over the years that there are plenty, but to try and figure out what they have been on the spot is, is tricky. So, yeah. but that uh, that brush with the DRC when we first started dealing with Wilson Daniels that that was very very memorable. I would I would think that would have made a positive impression on you that they would certainly what did. did a, <laughs> what did a bottle of 1971 DRC Grand Sessions cost in a Australian or New Zealand restaurant at the time. No, it was, it was at a London restaurant. A London? On the oh my God. So it, was Lord a, knows it, was actually, it was a pretty decent restaurant. Um, I would hasten to guess it was a lot less than it would be now. <laughs> there was that was that, 1988. So. There was that yeah. Vietnamese restaurant called Tan Dien that supposedly had the biggest DRC collection in the world. Yeah. In London. I don't know. Um, well, I just want to thank you for your time. This has been uh, absolutely fantastic. Thank Allison, thank you so much for uh, facilitating yes, it. I appreciate it. And uh, uh, keep making great wine, man. Thank you very much. Nice meeting you. Nice meeting you, Allison. Yes, Paul. Hopefully in person sometime soon. Yes, sometime soon. <laughs> well, for us, yeah. before, we'll, 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 we're stuck in the bottom of the world here, but we'll... We'll yeah, exactly. <laughs> come, come to Minneapolis. In the, so. Come yeah. to Minneapolis in the spring or summer and have a tasting with us here in this room. That'd be fun. Don't come in February. <laughs> no. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you both Probably. so much. I appreciate Thank it. This was Thanks, Hoyt. Right. Thank have you. a great Thank day. You, Thank you both. Right. Bye. Bye.